Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the content director here at Word on Fire Catholic Ministries. Joining us is His Excellency Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, good to talk with you. Hey, Brandon. Always good to see you and hear from you, even though we're a continent away from each other. That's right. It was exciting for me to see pictures just a day or two ago of a big gathering you held at your Episcopal residence there in Santa Barbara, where you brought all the priests and religious of your region there for a nice dinner and good camaraderie. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite moments in the summer. We actually have four of these dinners. We have um, two for the deacons and their wives, and then we have two for uh, priests. And the second one for priests, we also invite the uh, the women religious to come. And they're just a lot of fun. And in my backyard, we have tacos and fellowship. And I give a little kind of fervorino or review of the year. But the idea is to thank all these good people for helping us. And uh, I especially love the one when all the sisters come because we have a lot of religious in my region. And these sisters that do, I mean, tremendous work uh, with the sick and with the poor in a completely self-effacing way, you know, and to see them there and uh, and their fellowship and good cheer. And one of my favorite moments, uh, I forget her name now, but there was a wonderful young sister from Korea who's in the region for the summer studying English. Well, she comes in with this bag and the other sister said, this is a gift, Bishop, for you. I said, oh, isn't that nice? You know, so I take it out. Well, it was amazing. It's this candle. It's this big, huge candle on the front of which is my coat of arms. And on the back, it says word on fire. So she had made this candle because she had been following word on fire in Korea for many years. And uh, anyway, that was a highlight for me. That's really good. Well, I'm sorry to say that from that good news, we have to turn to some more troubling news because the focus of this yeah. episode is on what I'm calling the Eucharist problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in regards to this recent Pew Research Center study. It's been getting a lot of attention, especially online, that uh, discovered after they surveyed a bunch of Catholics in the Pew that just one third, actually a little less than one third of U.S. Catholics agree with the church that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. Or to turn it around, they found 69% of Catholics mm -hmm. in the United States believed that the bread and wine and mass are just symbols of the body and blood of Christ. And as you observed, when you kind of poured a little deeper into the data, that number goes up to 80% when you look yeah. at Catholics 40 and under. 80% of young Catholics believe that the Eucharist is merely a symbol. Uh, what, what was your initial reaction to this? Well, it was it was anger, to be honest with you. It was anger. And again, I'm not cast in blame. I'm anger, angry at everybody in the church because, look, our job, you know, one of our principal jobs as, as Catholics is to pass on the faith in its integrity. Uh, yes, we care for the poor. Yes, we worship God, as, as uh, Pope Benedict XVI said. But we also uh, catechize. We also evangelize. We also teach the faith. And we're not talking here, Brandon, about some minor bit of Catholic trivia. You know, do most Catholics think, uh, you know, uh, it's appropriate for a priest to wear such and such on such a feast day? We're not talking about that. We're talking about one of the most central teachings of our faith. In fact, in terms of the sacraments, the, I'd say, central teaching of the faith. Uh, and that an overwhelming majority of our own people <laughs> don't know what we teach. If you had done a, done a general survey, of the whole country, you know, Catholics, non-Catholics, believers, non-believers. Hey, what do Catholics think about the Eucharist? And I came up with these figures. Even that would bother me because I think, well, gosh, they don't even, no one even knows what we teach, but that our own people don't know what we teach on a centrally important issue is a cause of extraordinary concern. It ought to be. And we'll see what I don't want. I don't want the Catholic establishment. Again, I'm including myself here. I'm not I'm not dividing things up and let's blame people. If we were just write this off as, oh, well, you know, uh, it was poorly formulated, the questions in the survey, or people didn't really understand. Come on, come on. We've got a serious problem here in terms of passing on uh, the integral teaching of our faith. And so, yeah, I think it's a major wake-up call. I think it's a sort of fire bell in the night. I want to spend a little time talking about how we got into this crisis and then maybe what we can do in response to it. But let's first focus on this problem. How did we get here? I, a lot of the Catholics that I've seen commenting on this survey 
want to pin it to one specific cause. You know, I've seen, oh, it's it's the fault of the Novus Ordo or so many people receiving communion on the hand or moving tabernacles away from the altar. Uh, what do you think? Why, do, why are so many Catholics confused about this basic teaching? Well, first, I, I strongly agree with you, Brandon, that there's always multiple causation. And whenever you have a move toward, hey, oh, there it is. Got it. I found it. That's the reason. It's almost always wrong. Right? There's usually almost always multiple uh, causes, both theoretical and practical, cultural, ecclesial, et cetera, et cetera. So certainly we'd say that. And a thoroughgoing discussion of it would involve probably hours of, of sharing points of view and so on. But you know what I go back to, and you and I have talked about it a lot. When you ask young people, what's the main reason why you're leaving the Catholic faith? They say, we don't believe the teachings. And so they point to, call it a catechetical or apologetic or intellectual reason. They don't accept the teaching of the church. I, I think there's been really bad catechesis around this question. I think we haven't paid careful attention to how we carry on uh, the faith here and how we express it. So again, multiple causes, and I'll, I'll agree with that. You know, the whole Novus Ordo thing, I, and that opens up a whole other discussion. And, you know, the Novus Ordo fed the spiritual lives of Mother Teresa and John Paul II. I mean, so people who had intense devotion to the Eucharist. I'm not going to uh, say, well, the Novus Ordo caused this problem. I think first and foremost, really bad teaching, really bad catechesis around this. And maybe a, an indifference to it. Like, oh, well, you know, whether you say it's the real presence or a symbol, who really cares? As long as, you know, fill in the blank, you're, you're feeding the hungry, as long as you're caring for the poor, as long as you're a good person, right? But that's simply not Catholicism. We don't divide these aspects of the church's life in that neat way. Um, no, in fact, clarity about the Eucharist will conduce toward the proper care of the poor and the hungry and the homeless, et cetera, you know? So anyway, I, I think it's a lot to do with how poorly we've, we've taught this business. I think you've quoted your great mentor, Cardinal George, on a few different occasions when he said something to the effect of, when you lose the, the pious devotional practices yep. behind a belief, the belief soon thereafter evanesces. And You've used the example of genuflecting when you enter yeah. a church, genuflecting toward the Eucharist or Tabernacle. That when we stop doing that, it has an effect on our belief about the Eucharist. Right, and so that's the next point I want to make. Having said what I said about uh, catechesis, not gainsaying it for a second, I'm enough of a Newman man to know that that assent to a religious proposition is always more than simply ratiocination. It's more than how we're thinking about it. It has a lot to do with experience, hunch, intuition, example, etc. And yes, Cardinal George's point is very well taken. Cardinal George, by the way, who loved the Eucharist and, and had a very strong sense of the catechetical importance of teaching about it clearly, you know, but said precisely what you uh, recounted. I think I've, maybe we've talked about it on this show before, which I always love this story about uh, Catholics of my parents' generation. So go back now to Catholics from the 40s and 50s. They say that when they would come into a movie theater to watch a movie, they would just instinctively, they would genuflect before they entered the, the row because it was so in their bodies as they came into a row that that's what you do. But the point there is that reverence for the Eucharist, that when you come into a church, of course you genuflect before you enter your pew, you genuflect as you, as you come into the church. That was a pious practice that grew out of the church's faith and then in turn, reinforce the church's faith. Go back to my little book from years ago called The Strangest Way, where I talk about this. And I, I was following William James, the great American philosopher. They said that the body is involved in belief in a very powerful way. You, you can't do a platonic move of saying, well, that's just a matter of the mind. And then my body's doing something else. That, that the body influences faith, influences our convictions. That what we do with our bodies uh, reinforces or maybe undermines our, our intellectual beliefs. Like, for example, this morning, Brandon, when I did my holy hour, I came down 545, whatever it was, I had my cup of coffee. I came into my little chapel and, um, you know, no one's watching me. <laughs> There's no one there. But I, I always, you know, I, I genuflect before the Blessed Sacrament. As I enter the, I, I take holy water from the font, I genuflect. 
Well, it, it's my body signaling, if you want, to my soul, what we're dealing with here. I, I'm not just walking into another room of my house, like I'm walking into the kitchen. No, I'm walking into the presence of the of the Eucharistic Lord, you know? So that's a long answer to your question, which is a, a good one. Yes, our pious practices around the Eucharist, when those are compromised, like, you know, you and I both know this. Too often you come into, say, Sunday, a Catholic Mass, and um, Mass is over, but now people are just kind of milling around in the church itself, in the presence of the, of the tabernacle, but behaving the way you behave on the, on the sports field or something, or, or in the vestibule. Again, nothing wrong with fellowship after Mass. I'm all in favor of it. Don't get me wrong. Go out in the vestibule, go out in the parking lot, and go to the hall and all that. But if in the church itself, in the presence of, of the Eucharistic Lord, we don't exhibit reverential behavior that signals to our souls, oh, I guess nothing important is going on here. Nothing distinctive is present in this room. And of course, you know this better than I with your six kids, how kids are so attentive, right, to these truths. When your kids watch you and Kathleen genuflecting at Mass and praying reverentially. I mean, that's that's how you're teaching them the real presence. Long before they've read uh, questions, you know, 75 and so on of the third part of the Summa, they know in their bones the real presence. So anyway, I agree with you. <laughs> you know, we've looked at it intellectually. We've looked at the devotional problems that undergird this crisis. Um, let's look at, at it maybe spiritually. Um, it it deeply concerns me that if if 80% of young people or 70% of the church in general are receiving communion just thinking that it's merely a symbol yeah reading that situation in light of St Paul's line in his first letter to the Corinthians where he says anyone who drinks anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body the body of Christ eats and drinks judgment on himself what do you think that this misunderstanding of what the Eucharist is, is doing spiritually to the church? I mean, is it part of some of the struggles and spiritual crises we're undergoing? Sure, it's not helping at all. And you're right. That's the source of the church's, more than etiquette, the church's doctrine around the, re the reception of the Blessed Sacrament is, it's not like, hey, it's candy at the party. Everyone come and just, you know, come on and get it. It's we do this act of discernment, as, as Paul says, and someone who's in a state of mortal sin receives the Eucharist unworthily and, in fact, does more spiritual damage. And so the sort of cavalier attitude toward the Eucharist, um, yes, it's true to say, you know, as Pope Francis has emphasized many times, that it's medicine for the sick, et cetera. But see, the Aquinas distinction there is, yes, you give medicine to sick people, but you don't give medicine to dead people. And, and that's Thomas Aquinas, that if you're in a state of mortal sin, if the spiritual life is gone in you, so to speak, you have to go to confession so that that life is restored. Then you can receive the medicine of the Eucharist. So, you know, if just we follow the sort of inner logic of that imagery, that's what we come up with. And yes, we've certainly underplayed. Now, now granted, we maybe things were overstated years ago, you know, in my parents' generation, and people were hung up on guilt and all that. But I mean, hung up on guilt, I don't think that, that's the the presenting spiritual problem of our time. Uh, au contraire, you know, I mean, so yeah, you discern carefully. Are you are you in a state of soul worthy to receive the blessed sacrament? Um, if not, as Paul said, you're eating and drinking your condemnation. When the Pew survey came out, you made a little video reaction. It was kind of your initial reaction. And one thing you especially lamented was how we Catholics tend to drive a wedge between apologetics or catechesis yeah. on the one hand and what you called pastoral friendliness, you know, or kind of getting along and welcoming people. You said it in another way, you said pitting doctrine against social justice or the works yeah, of right. mercy. Uh, say more about that. Why is that so problematic? It drives me crazy. So my great heroes go back to Reynold Hillenbrand, my predecessor as rector at Mundelein back in the 30s and 40s. Go back to Thomas Merton, go back to Dorothy Day, go back to Jacques Maritain, go back to all the leaders in the Catholic kind of social action tradition. You know what they all had in common? Dorothy Day, obviously. They all had a profound love for the Blessed Sacrament, a profound reverence for the Eucharist. 
Think of Mary Tan, you know, who was very devoted to, to social action, social justice, who would spend the whole night in Eucharistic adoration up in Montmartre in Paris. Thomas Merton, Dorothy Day, who would, who would spend, I mean, three and four days on a retreat, who would spend an hour on her knees in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Reynold Hillenbrand, for whom the liturgy was the source of all the church's social uh, outreach and, and commitment to justice. If and when devotion to the Eucharist begins to be compromised, so will the commitment to the poor be compromised, or, or it will devolve merely into a type of social work, etc. So, I, see, I, I want to keep those three dimensions together that, that Benedict talked about. Joseph Ratzinger. The church worships God. There's the liturgy, right? The church cares for the poor in all these different ways. Think of everything from Catholic uh, action, Catholic charities, the Catholic relief services. I mean, all the ways that the church reaches out. And the church evangelizes. It does all those three things. When you isolate any one of them and you say, oh no, that's what we're all about. Trouble follows as night follows day. Um, those three things, by the way, correspond roughly to the priest, prophet, king uh, distinction. And again, don't reduce it to one or the other. Don't say we're all about you know priesthood. Then it's all liturgy and sacraments. Don't say it's all prophecy. Then it, there's nothing but teachers, etc. You know the kingly office. The kingly office is about bringing about the kingdom of God. That's part of it. And so, yeah, care for the poor and social justice. That's part of the kingly office. But don't reduce the church to any one of those three. But when the three are in a dynamic interrelationship and see in the best people, in the great saints, that's always on display, it seems to me. Um, and that's a problem. If, if we've lost a sense of the Eucharist, the other two will fall away as well. A few years back, uh, I wrote this book called Saints and Social Justice. And so I spent yeah. a long time yeah. looking at these <clears throat> saints that were so devoted to the poor. And the biggest lesson I learned was when I was reading the writings of Mother Teresa and Pier Giorgio Fersati, they both said almost the exact same thing when it comes to this link between adoring the Blessed Sacrament and serving the poor in the street. Because mm -hmm. they said, it's only when I'm able to recognize Christ behind the disguise, behind the form of bread and wine, that I'm able to recognize Christ behind the form of the poor. Yeah. And so they said adoration was like a training ground for yeah. being able to go and find him in the streets. And to your point, if, if I can't, if I no longer recognize the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, I'm going to stop recognizing him among the poor. Absolutely. What made Maximilian Kolbe's great sacrifice possible? What made Edith Stein's great sacrifice possible? Both of them were intensely devoted to the Blessed Sacrament. If you said to Edith Stein, who would spend about 10 years of her life when she was a teacher, she'd spend hours every day before the Blessed Sacrament. In fact, the Dominican nuns with whom she lived reserved a special chair for her behind a, a pillar that she, she kind of liked to sit there where she could see the tabernacle. What made her sacrifice possible, her great witness at Auschwitz possible, those 10 years, those 10 years before the Blessed Sacrament? Um, hey, it's only a symbol that we've contrived and we put together. And so, you know, Brandon, you and I, let's sit down and let's come up with a symbol of word on fire. How about we get the little word on fire, you know, sign, put it up on the wall, uh, have a picture from our first filming series. Hey, that evokes word on fire. Great. Great. Fine. I'm all in favor of it. Let's have a birthday party and have a symbol of the of the person that we're celebrating. Terrific. Nothing against it. Or or at the highest levels, your Melville, your Hawthorne, your Flannery O'Connor, you're dealing with symbolic uh, imagery and language at the highest level of sophistication. But it was Flannery O'Connor, master of symbolic literature, who said famously about the Eucharist, if it's only a symbol, I say to hell with it. Right? And, and that's the Catholic difference. By the way, and I've heard this ad nauseum all my life, please don't feed me the line, oh, you don't really understand the meaning of symbol. Yes, I do. And so did Flannery O'Connor. I mean, she was one of the great users of symbolism. How about our, our mutual friend, G.K. Chesterton, a master of symbolic literature. And yet when the Blessed Sacrament would go by in a procession in his little humble hometown, this big man, 300 and whatever pounds he was, would get down on his knees because he said, I knew the creator of the universe was going by. Now, say to G.K. Chesterton or to, or to Flannery O'Connor, well, you know, God bless them. They don't really understand the power of symbols. Give me a break. Give me a break. 
or to Karl Wojtyla or to Jacques Maritain or to Edith Stein. Don't patronize me with this language of, oh, you don't really understand what symbolism means. I completely understand. I love symbolism. And these great masters of symbolic literature reverend symbols. And they knew that the Eucharist is something totaliter aliter, right? It's totally other. There's a qualitative difference between the merely symbolic and what's what we're talking about in the Eucharist, you know? Anyway, I'm getting wound up again, but... Um, this is a central, it's a, it's a pivotal uh, issue in the church, and we have to keep addressing it honestly. All right, let, let's zoom back out here. So we mentioned in the beginning, 69% of Catholics think the Eucharist is only a symbol. They, they think it's nothing more than just a memorial. It evokes, you know, Jesus' presence, and it's a symbolic way yeah. to connect with him. What do we do moving forward? Uh, what do we do as individuals? What do we do as a church? What would you recommend for Catholics listening to this? Well, I'd say, you know, Brandon, the two things that we kind of focused on, let's start with that, namely a lot better and clearer catechesis. How about from the time kids are little? And, and I, you know, look at those old textbooks from years ago when even words like transubstantiation were used with kids in fourth and fifth grade. Stop dumbing it down. Stop underplaying what kids are capable of. Start talking about the Eucharist with greater clarity. But then secondly, start treating the Eucharist with greater reverence. Uh, let it get into the bodies of, of our people, not just their minds. So their minds, absolutely. But then let it get into the, the practices around the Eucharist. Those are two things we can do, I think, you know, right away. You know, I thought this is a catechetical problem that, you know, bishops and priests and church leaders can help teach more about the Eucharist. But as a as a parent, I'm reading this through the lens of a family life and thinking, you know, I have a tremendous responsibility to make sure that my kids understand what the Eucharist is. You know, like I, I was thinking the other day when they grow up, you know, what's the one thing I wish I could instill with them? Well, maybe that God exists. OK, that's that's all right. Maybe that they love Jesus. Good. Much better but that they love Jesus through the Eucharist. And I, I came to the conclusion, if that's all that I'm able to do for them, everything else will work out. Everything else will flow from that. I remember, Brandon, this is now a couple years ago. So your kids were a bit younger and you were all out here at, at my house. And, you know, the kids were horsing around as they always do. And, and, and then you brought maybe two or three of your kids into the chapel and they were, you know, they were excited and they were, and they came into the room and you just said something very simple, like, no, this is Jesus. And, and it kind of just brought them to focus and attention. And they realized, okay, we've crossed a sort of liminal space into a altogether different sacred space. We're not just in the living room or in the kitchen. We're in an altogether different space. But that's a big part of it, isn't it? Uh, you, were, you were disciplining them body, mind, soul, you know, around this issue. Right, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. If you have a question okay. for Bishop Barron, visit askbishopbarron.com. That's the website. You can record your question on any device. Today we have a Eucharistic question from Joseph in North Carolina. Here's his question. Hello, Bishop Barron. This is Joseph in Raleigh, North Carolina. I have a question regarding the Eucharist. I have a friend who is thinking about joining the faith. And his concern is that if the Eucharist is that which gives us life within us, why is it reserved only for Catholics? Yeah, good. Thank you for that. And that it is one of the master metaphors that's used for the Eucharist, that it's it's the bread of life. It sustains us in the spiritual life. Here's a quick answer. Um, the Eucharist sustains the life that's given to us in baptism. So not, not just physical life, but now the spiritual life that's given to us in baptism. That's why you would not give the Eucharist to people who aren't baptized. So if we'd simply say, okay, it's food, you know, keeps you alive spiritually, why wouldn't we just give the Eucharist to every single person in the world? Well, because they don't have within them the spiritual life that's given through baptism. It's what sustains that life. More to it, go back to Brandon's earlier point from St. Paul. Uh, why don't we just give the Eucharist to, to all Catholics then? Well, if you're not in a worthy state to receive, then you're actually eating and drinking your own condemnation. Uh, broaden it out further. Why not give the Eucharist to, to Protestants of goodwill, good-hearted Protestant people that come to Mass? Well, 
see, my answer is always this. When someone comes forward and you say the body of Christ and the, the answer ritually is amen, where you're saying, I agree, I, I accept that. Well, see, if, if I'm a Protestant and I don't agree that that is the body of Christ, well, then I shouldn't say amen. And for me as a Catholic to say, oh, come on, everyone comes up, you all must say amen, that in a way is showing a deep disrespect to those who don't share that faith. So again, we say those that share our Eucharistic faith, who have the divine life of baptism in them, who are worthy to receive, they're the ones who ought to receive the Blessed Sacrament. Um None of it is, you know, the trouble is we, we think today in terms of simply exclusion or inclusion, but I think we have to approach it with a more nuanced uh, hermeneutic. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of the Word on Fire show. We have really exciting news. Last summer, we filmed two new episodes for our film series, Catholicism, The Pivotal Players. One episode was on Fulton Sheen, the great media evangelist. The other one was on Flannery O'Connor, whom we mentioned a few times during this episode. Both of those films are now available to subscribers of the Word on Fire Institute. They'll be available to everybody else in another month or two. But if you sign up for the Word on Fire Institute, you can start streaming them right now, right this minute. So go to wordonfire.institute. That's the website, mm -hmm. wordonfire.institute. Join over 5,000 other Catholics from all over the world and learning how to be a better catechist and evangelist. We've got some special resources on the Eucharist as well. But uh, you'll get this special bonus of early streaming access to the Fulton Sheen and Flannery episodes. Bishop, I, I know you've said this Flannery O'Connor episode you think is the best film we've ever produced. I do. And, you know, I've been involved with this from the beginning, of course, and all through the Catholicism series, all through Pivotal Players, the, the smaller films we've made. When I saw it, a couple months ago, when I saw the at least near finished version, um, that's what I said. I said. I think it's the best film that we've made. Uh, so yeah, watch it. I think you'll love it. So join the Word on Fire Institute. Start watching it right now. Two final shout outs to a couple of patrons who have helped support this Word on Fire show. Louis Pablo de Vale. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And James Powell. Uh, Louis and James, thanks guys. We, we really appreciate your support. You help make this show happen. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on the Word on Fire show. <laughs>